are going live in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Sir, we are live now. Thank you, Maharshi and Ortho TV, and uh, good morning, everyone. Today we are going to talk about uh, different pathologies around knee joint, which are uh, not that rare, but uh, sometimes they they strike us and uh, we might get confused with what to do. We have uh, two excellent speakers from Mumbai, Dr. Chintan Doshi, who talked about proximal femoral fractures, I mean, femoral shaft fractures uh, a few weeks back, and our own and my dear friend, Dr. Tushar, uh, and he will talk about proximal tibial. His talk in POSICON was uh, very appealing, and, and so I invited him today to uh, guide all of us today. Now, Dr. Kalpesh Trivedi, who is an arthroscopist uh, from Ahmedabad, he's, he was not keeping well, so he is not joining. And uh, we'll talk about some interesting tibia vara, unilateral tibia vara cases at the end. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Chintan uh, to start uh, his presentation. These are these all our case based discussion, so you can raise your hand and inquire. Dr. Goda and Dr. Meet, uh, our current fellows, would moderate this session and they'll uh, uh, you put your questions in the chat box and they will inquire with the faculty at the end. I hope you'll all enjoy this session. Chintan, go ahead, please. Uh, can you see the presentation, sir? Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, Maureen, sir, for inviting me. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Chintan Doshi, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon from Mumbai. And I'm going to discuss uh, two very unique fractures we don't see very often uh, during our practice. One is tibial tuberosity fractures and the tibial spine fractures. So these two areas are uh, very unique in, uh, in the proximal tibia where the ligaments are attached. So tibial tuberosity is the apophysis where patellar ligament is attached. And tibial spine is an anterior prom prominent part of the intercondyl eminence where the ACL is attached. So both of these uh, injuries are actually avulsion type injuries where both the ligaments uh, pull on the bony fragment, which is not fused yet, and then it causes the fracture. Typically in tibial tuberosity fractures, uh, let's discuss how it happens, what is the etiology. So these fractures are mostly during adolescent when the physis has started to fuse and the tibial Tuberosity physe is still open and uh, the child is very active in sports. So it happens due to uh, eccentric quadriceps contraction, which happens forcefully during push-off or landing from a jump. And the tibial tubercle uh, growth plate breaks off, uh, which is unfused. So most common is 12 to 16-year-old adolescent. Uh, injuries are basketball the most common because it involves jumping and landing on the feet uh, with eccentric quadriceps contracture. And uh, 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 soccer, football, the other ones uh, which are contact sports. Uh, adults' uh, counterpart of this injury is usually a patellar tendon rupture, and it is not usually the tibial tuberosity avulsion. So, uh, because of few uh, bone is fused to the the uh, metaphysis, then it is a tendon which ruptures. Here, the bone avulses uh, from the growth plate. So, look. Uh, Looking at the classification, which will help us further in the management, uh, Watson Jones first classified this into three types. Uh, type one was fracture of the apophysis only. Type two was fracture of the apophysis with some involvement of the epiphysis, but the fracture line still not exiting into the joint. Type three was where the fracture line exited into the joint and it was displaced. So Ogden then modified this into A and B. He kept the one, two, and three same uh, as the fracture line uh, not exiting the joint then exiting the joint two and three. But A was the simple and minimally displaced fracture. Type B was mainly a combinated fracture where there were two or three fragments, and then it was completely displaced. Uh, there are These are two mo modifications which came out after uh, Ogden published his uh, classification, and these were Ogden type four and type five. These were the fractures which were seen again in the adolescent where the fracture line was uh, going all the way through the tibial tuberosity into the epiphysis and then exiting posteriorly into the metaphysis or posteriorly through the physis. So, so Chintan, my question is, do we need MRI to uh, specifically classify these injuries or we can do it on x-rays only? So, sir, all, uh, most of the time x-rays uh, suggest so this happens in adolescence. 
So most of the time, X-ray is suggestive. We we see the fracture line. Uh, so I'll discuss that in the cases where we okay, fine. have some uh, uh, controversy, but then it can be done on table. But mm. to be on a better side, uh, we can do a CT or a, a MRI. So MRI will be better because you can see associated meniscal injury or other injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will uh, delineate the fracture line uh, perfectly. Uh, so, so, uh, so yeah, so type 4 was going posteriorly and type 4 was similar to type 4, which was by McCoy and uh, Stanitsky, but the fracture line here also goes into the joint. It's like a Y type. So, it, through the tribal tuberosity into the joint and then going posteriorly through the posterior metaphysis. So, uh, we'll discuss the management based on the clinical cases, uh, not, not a didactic theory lecture. So, uh, so this was uh, a comminuted tibial tuberosity fracture in a 14-year-old boy where uh, he had injury while playing football and there was an avulsion from the tibial tuberosity side. So I usually do these measurements. So this was, uh, this. most of these cases are from Singapore when I was there for a period of uh, a year where I saw many tibial tuberosity fractures and almost of all types. So we used to get this measurement so as to get the exact screw length and uh, not uh, having a screw uh, jut out posteriorly or, you know, impinge on the soft tissues. So, uh, a tibial tuberosity fracture most often uh, and always should be open reduced, not a closed action because there is, like how we have for medial malleolus, there is periosteal interposition. Uh, Uh, reduce it with a uh, 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 pointed reduction clamp or with the wires, uh, mosquito forceps. But it is always better to take out that periosteum between the fracture site and uh, the fracture fragment and the uh, parent metaphysis. So, Chintan, so, can we hyperextend the leg, the tibial part, and see whether it is getting reduced? And if we can reduce it well, can we do percutaneous? Or uh, we have to manipulate the patellar tendon? To put this so, um, uh, so um, almost always we don't need to manipulate or uh, do uh, manual. see if we hyperextend there is a chance it will sit but again uh, that periosteum or the soft tissue which is interposed uh, will cause hindrance so you will always see a gap uh, so when we fix this hmm. there is no gap between the fracture fragment and the metaphysis and if there is a soft tissue interposition and okay. it is almost always there because uh, I might have opened about six to seven of them and there okay. is always some periosteum going into that uh, area because see, this is an avulsion type of fracture. Yeah. So as soon as the bone avulses, the, the surrounding periosteum just invaginates into that fracture pattern. So it's not a good idea or not a good recommendation to do it uh, as a closed duction and fixation. If okay. you're doing a fixation, open it, reduce, uh, remove the interposing periosteum and fix it. Similar now, to what uh, we I, I saw your screws in the center. So, how you put the, uh, the what do you do with the patella tendon? You go through patella tendon or what do you do? Yeah. So, uh, so patella tendon is uh, uh, attached to the tibial tuberosity. So, attachment of patella tendon is all the way from the tip of the tibial tuberosity in, till the time the uh, tuberosity is there till the uh, epiphysis. So, mm -hmm. most of the attachment we preserve. We don't uh, delineate or we don't uh, excise uh, and, uh, you know, mm. make the fragment visible to us. What we do, the patellar tendon is there. We don't need to do anything. Just make a vertical slit. Okay. Uh, so that the screw can bury into the tendon and it's not prominent uh, under the skin. So just okay. make a vertical slit and uh, make the screw sit on the, uh, uh, on the bone. And I always try to use a washer whenever it is possible because screw uh, this these are metaphysical bone and if you tighten the screw to get the compression chances are that the screw head will just go into it and that screw will back out from the posterior side so a washer is always a good help okay. so that the screw head doesn't uh, you know uh, go into the uh, bury into the bone it is just underneath the patella tendon okay so this is uh, the post op x ray of this patient and uh, we have a four months follow where it was completely healed and then see here, we see this X-ray, screws are very, very prominent. So this is the most common complication or drawback of the surgery. It is always palpable under the, almost under the subcutaneous tissue. And uh, mo almost always it is better to do a removal because, uh, you know, it will cause bursa or any other problems mm -hmm. in the future. And how long you immobilize or you, is it based on X-ray or? 
Okay. How so long so I been? so my immobilization will be based on uh, the classification how 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 comminuted the fracture fragment is, how displaced it was at the initial stage, and uh, uh, how how long we needed to get the callus. In a type three, I will immobilize it for a longer time because the fracture line was exiting through the joint. So mm -hmm. I will immobilize it for about four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, in in such a case where it is just in the apophysis, I would immobilize it for three weeks or maybe maximum four weeks, and then uh, start neuroing. So okay. because this is avulsion, if I start neuroing on day two, day three, again it is only the screw holding the fracture pattern. If there is a pull on the uh, tendon, and these kids are very notorious. First of all, right. they got an injury because they are very active in sports. They want to go back to sports, so it is always better. If not a cast, at least a long leg knee brace where right. uh, it can be, uh, you know, protected. No, cast is always good. Cast, I always prefer a cast. Uh, I don't trust the kids. So they always want to go do at least something more than what we always suggest. So yeah, cast is always better. And uh, so we go to the next type. So that was type uh, 2B. Now, uh, let's discuss this one. A 13-year-old boy heard a pop while playing basketball when he landed on the uh, from a jump. And uh, this looks a comminuted uh, tibial tuberosity fracture not going into the epiphysis, maybe 1B or 2B. And that was what most of us uh, thought on the poll, uh, which was discussed yesterday. Uh, but let's look at the surprise that we're going to get here. So this was the first x-ray before I made any skin incision. I wanted to check, you know, what is the fracture pattern. I went in with the idea it would be type 2B or so. But uh, then once opened, you see uh, the uh, my uh, retractors here. Uh, it is an open reduction. So once opened, I thought the fragment was moving a little more than what usually I see in a tibial diversity fracture. So I decided to put up uh, mosquito forceps in, and there the fracture line was all uh, already connecting to the joint line. It was pretty much mobile. So uh, then what I was done? So this was not two or one. It was a type three Ogden uh, and comminuted. So okay. let, let's let's redefine the Ogden. Type one is kind of undisplaced. Type undisplaced. two is only epiphysis, and type three is uh, epiphysis with epiphysis fracture, right? Type one is uh, epiphysis. And huh. type 1 can be displaced, but type 1A is minimally displaced and simple single fragment. Mm -hmm. Type 1B is only epiphysis with combination or okay. um, uh, grossly displaced fracture. Mm. So that is 1A, 1B. 2A is a fracture line which goes into the epiphysis but does not exit into the joint. Okay. So you will see a fragment which is, you know, uh, your anterior uh, proximal tibial physis is also involved, but then it is not uh, quite mobile and the uh, cartilage in the joint side is still mm. preserved, uh, the bone is still preserved there. So that mm. is 2A, which is minimally displaced, 2B again, it is comminuted or completely displaced. And 3 is the one which exits into the joint. Okay. So that is uh, A and B again, combination and simple. Right. Chintan, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Uh, see, uh, you may be having the privilege of following up also these patients. So, do they give symptoms like osgood schlatter later? Means they get anterior tibial tuberosity pain into late adolescence or early adulthood. Are they able to go back to their original sports at the same yeah. level? So, uh, so they are able to go back to the original sports. That is there. They don't get uh, features of Osgood's letter very often. Uh, one, because we are doing a compression here. We are going to put a screw and get a compression and we want the physis to fuse. Something like SCFE, if you do an in-situ pinning, you want that uh, physis to close uh, faster so that it doesn't cause a uh, problem again of avulsion in the future here in tibial tuberosity. So the purpose of, and these are near adolescent. These are almost uh, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, where... So again, if you do a compression screw in a very young kid, almost less than 10 years, the, the other complication that we face is recurvator because the physis has started fusing early because of our compression screw and then that will cause recurvatum in the proximal tibia. So, uh, so, so these are the common problems, hardware prominence, recurvatum, but not uh, what you uh, think that it would be Osgood's slatter or something. And yes, the pain on the tibial tuberosity is there. There is swelling because the, the screws are poking there. The head is still there under the skin and it causes bursa. So almost always at one year or, or maybe 10 months or one year, uh, once we see that everything is going good and uh, bone is healed well, we remove the screws. 
but you can assure them of going back to their sports yes so uh, about 4 months <clears throat> once uh, one month of casting uh, till we see healing and then uh, there is knee range of motion for 3 months so in 4 months if the full range is achieved and full power is achieved then uh, uh, by 4 months they can go back to sports yeah go ahead most of these cases are from Singapore. So I don't have a, a very long-term follow-up. The, the longest I have is uh, about nine months where we had removed the screw also. So, uh, yeah, but then uh, this is what we follow. At four months, we allow them to go back to sports if the strength is good and if the bone knee healing is good. So coming back to this uh, case where we had a pole. Uh, so this is this turned out to be an uh, Ogden type 3B. And then again, the fixation is uh, with CC screws. So now when it is two, two or three or then we try to fix the uh, epiphysis as well because uh, the fracture line has gone into the epiphysis. It is, in this, it has gone into the joint. So we want the epiphysis also to fuse along with all the fracture and the epiphysis also to fuse in anatomical position. Uh, because if any, there is any step or anything uh, uh, during the fixation, then it will lead to arthritis, early arthritis in the future. So we want anatomical uh, reduction and anatomical fixation in this case. Uh, so if you see here, I use two guide wires. The, the, the one in the epiphysis was smaller mm -hmm. diameter, the one in the metaphysis was di bigger diameter. So what screws we use for tibial tuberosity fracture? If you're putting in the metaphysis, I always prefer to use a thicker screw, which is a 6.5 cc screw. Uh, in the epiphysis, we may not have that privilege always. So uh, there may be a thin epiphysis and of 6.5 may not go all the way and probably may put it into the joint or into the uh, posterior uh, 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 physis, which may cause growth arrest. So uh, what we put is a, a 4 mm, a 4.5 or 4 or a 4.5 mm CC screw, whichever is available. But in this case I had, so when I put the guide wire, I saw there was a, enough bone and I put the wire screw on the uh, skin and see if there is, it's not going to poke anywhere. So then I put a 6.5 here as well. So that is how uh, we'll fix the uh, epiphysis and the uh, fibrosity onto the metaphysis. So this is a two months follow up of a case which was done. Now, uh, again, this is a bilateral tibial fracture. Uh, again, a jump during basketball where the, uh, the uh, boy landed on both the feet simultaneously and it caused avulsion of the tibial fibrosity. So we see on the right side is comminuted uh, multiple fragments. Probably it is type 2B because it is going all the way into the epiphysis as well. Uh, but on the left side, we see a unique pattern which we discussed in the classification. The fracture line here is going from the tibial fibrosity. You see the lateral view. It is going all the way, exiting in the posterior uh, metaphysis. So it is type 4 Ogden, which is a modification of the Ogden classification. And there we add, so as uh, Mollins has suggested, whether we can see what's happening in extension. So at Singapore, we used to do this in, uh, in the emergency department of manipulation and reduction and see what is happening to the fragment, whether it's sitting or not. So we do, do hyperextension, apply a slab, and then admit the patient. And this is done with a little bit of sedation because we have, uh, uh, patient, we have uh, uh, pediatric doctors in the uh, emergency department who can give a sedation for a half an hour or so, and then we can do the procedure. Child wakes up with almost no pain because the slab is there. So when we do hyperextension here, so if you see on the right side, the fragment, because of the patella tendon, it is displaced further than what it was in the, uh, before the hyperextension. And uh, on the left side, it set well, but again, that is unstable because the fracture line is all the way going anterior to posterior. So this was what was decided to fix it on the, on table. Here you see my screw here on the, uh, the epiphysis screw is thinner than the metaphysical screw but it is also going in a different direction. Why? Because the fracture pattern was such. The upper fragment was such so oblique that uh, I had to put a screw perpendicular to the fracture line so as to get a compression in a way that it went through the anterior uh, physis. But then that is also important because any which way is almost near fusion, uh, we wanted to get good reduction and good uh, you know, fixation with this uh, fragment. On the, on the other side, I use a reduction clamp, a, a pointed reduction clamp or a patella clamp to get the uh, fragment reduced in extension and then uh, put a screw again in this. So these are the long-term follow-ups of these uh, patients, about six weeks, and then uh, it went on to, both sides went on to heal. 
Now in a bilateral case, I re refrained him from uh, six months from sports, but then once it heals, we can uh, allow them with uh, good strength. So uh, another case here, this was also a poll option uh, of what uh, is the management for this. And most of us uh, were of the option to do a compression screw. Yes, it is complete. It is quite a bit displaced and uh, you know there can be uh, periosteum interposition again here. So in this also, I will do open reduction and not just a closed reduction or extension uh, casting. So looking at this fracture pattern, it, uh, on the lateral view, initially it looks, there was some suspicion that it is going posterior. So again, it is not just a simple tibial tuberosity. It is a modification, type four Ogden modification, which is the fracture line going all the way from anterior to posterior, exiting into the metaphysis. So again, uh, open reduction was done uh, and uh, screw fixation for the same. And uh, both the screws are uh, 6.5 screws here and uh, it went on to heal nicely. So this is a four months follow up. And uh, just before starting sports, we want to see that the bone has healed well and there is no more gap at the tip window velocity level. So that is our four months follow up of uh, Ogden type four. So another in interesting case, and this I discussed uh, for options in the poll, uh, it looks a nasty proximal tibial fracture, uh, probably metaphysial, doesn't look like a tibial tuberosity on these x-rays at least. So we decided to get a CT scan done and look at what the pattern is showing. Again, what we discussed, type 4 Ogden type, where the fracture line is in the metaphysis going from tibial tuberosity exiting posteriorly. And the entire uh, epiphysis with the tuberosity and metaphysial fragment is uh, displaced. So uh, on table, what I I had kept everything. I had kept K wires. I had kept plate. I had kept screws. Everything I had kept because I was not sure how it's going to reduce. Whether it's going to go into varus or valgus. Whether I will need a additional plate fixation. But this is what how it reduced. And uh, just with extension and uh, holding the fragment in place. Uh, what I decided to do was to put a screw and then check for stability whether to put an additional plate or not. So that metaphysial line that we see on the AP X-ray is actually that frag fragment, uh, the fracture line of the posterior cortex, which is the uh, Ogden type uh, for the one which is exiting posteriorly. And that is a fragment which is uh, uh, of the part along with the tibial tuberosity, a single fragment. So I decided to do a, just a screw fixation because it is quite stable. And again, as Molin sir and we discussed, we're going to put this patient in cast at least till the time we see a good healing and uh, we are sure that it's not going to uh, displace further. I I refrain from using a plate here again because there was no virus or valgus deformity or uh, and it was after putting the screws, it was quite stable uh, and uh, there was no need to do any additional fixation for this. And for this, I only have a six weeks follow up uh, x ray with me. Anterior part looks healed very nicely. There is a fracture line which is seen posteriorly as well. So, post this, I uh, put him in a long leg knee brace and started gradual knee ROI. And then uh, later on, it went to heal. Uh, I don't have a follow up because then by then I had left Singapore. So, uh, as we already discussed with Tushar sir here, uh, what are the complications of these? So, uh, we have prominent hardware, we have recurvatum because there is early fusion of the anterior physis and uh, extensor lag uh, because it was a avulsion fracture to begin with. We have immobilized the cortices for a very long time, of almost about four to six weeks. There would be some extensor lag again because uh, the play on the patellar tendon may still be there. So it, uh, it's better to get rid of it before starting sports and stiffness if uh, immobilized for a very long time. So uh, take home messages in tibial tuberosity fracture, it is important to identify the fracture configuration. Displaced fracture will always almost need a surgical management. And here it is open reduction, not a simple closed reduction because there is almost always a periosteum interpose which has to be removed uh, when you pass the screw. Anatomical reduction with screw fixation uh, gives a good long-term result. Uh, only drawback is the prominent hardware which can be removed uh, once the fracture is healed. So Chintan, it has been already 20 minutes left. So I would wish you to go through rapidly through the tibial spine sure, cases. Sure, sure.
Uh, I'm sorry, but, but I think we had discussion in between. So I timed this to go into 12 to 13 minutes, but then it's okay. No, it's so tibial possible. spine fractures, uh, these are the ones which we are going to discuss here, the one where the ACL is attached. So these are very uncommon one in one lakh children fractures, not one in one, one lakh children, one in one lakh children fractures. All, almost these are also seen somewhere near adolescent age group from 8 to 14 years of age. And this is the adult counterpart is the ACL injury. Here, because uh, the uh, it is cartilaginous, it may just pull off with the uh, ACL and ACL may not tear, but uh, there is an avulsion fracture. So etiology, the most common is uh, a sudden pull or uh, a sudden break while riding a bicycle and full knee extension will cause this avulsion. Again, same, same thing can happen in skiing or any other contact sports. So uh, let's look into the classification, which will help us in the management again. So Mayer's and McIver's classification of is a most uh, accepted classification all over the world uh, for tibial spine fractures. It is this into three types. Type one is undisplaced. Type two is anteriorly it is open but the intact posterior hinge. And type three is where it is completely displaced and uh, the fragment is completely off the uh, tibial plateau. So. Imaging the best is a X-ray because you can visualize this and on a lateral X-ray it is very well visualized. A cartilage fragment will may not be visualized, but you may see some ACL laxity. So it is always useful to get an MRI done in these cases. Also because there are associated injuries in most of these cases. So it is usually recommended like not for tibial tuberosity fractures, but for tibial spine fractures almost 100% almost it is better to do an MRI to not miss out on any other things. And also to look at the fragment, how big is the fragment, whether uh, it is one single fragment, but it's combinated, a screw will help or a suture will help. So all this will be decided on MRI. So again, we decided on, uh, 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 we, we had a poll on this and as most of you suggested, yes, the meniscal injury is the most common, almost 54% incidence. So one in two will almost always have a meniscal injury, some type may not be a complete, may not even require a repair most of the times, but there may be a tear, there may be extraversation, there may be intermeniscal ligament interposition between the fracture fragments. I'll show an example of these. And sometimes there are associated ligament injuries when the force is into varus or valgus, so there can be collateral ligaments or uh, uh, sometimes uh, fragment uh, fibers of the ACL are also torn. So type one is undisplaced and usually is amenable to uh, casting an extension. Uh, type two is we attempt closed action here in casting an extension, but that pull is almost always there and it does not always sit anatomically. There is always an anterior opening. If you see that it is always better to go on to do arthroscopic fixation or open fixation with a screw or a suture because that even if it heals, that will give a laxity to the ACL ligament and further there'll be anterior instability and other issues uh, with the kid. And these are, uh, these patients are very active in sports. Again, it is important that we have a uh, very stable knee right, because they're going to go back to sports. So uh, type three is almost always uh, open reduction and internal fixation, operative reduction and internal fixation. It can be open or arthroscopic, whichever a surgeon is comfortable. Both are accepted. So blocks to reduction, as we already discussed, intermeniscal uh, transfer intermeniscal ligament and the meniscus are most common. And uh, if you see here, there's a tibial spine, all are marked with arrows. The tibial spine is lifted off anteriorly. The, the fracture base is that red part that we see on the just below the meniscus and the meniscus is already interposing <clears throat> between the fragment and the fracture base. So it is uh, always better to visualize this, get the good anatomical reduction and then fix it. So fixation is with uh, open or arthroscopic, whichever com surgeon is comfortable with. Screw and suture can be decided depending on the fracture geometry. So uh, let's look into both the options. So open, good is anterior approach, straight midline. You can uh, go parapatellar as well, no problem. Uh, direct visualization uh, of the fragment is very important. Fixation and division. We saw that intermeniscal ligament always going into the fracture base. So it is very important to fix under uh, vision, get a good anatomical reduction. And disadvantage is uh, here because it's open, we can miss out on uh, fixing the meniscus or anything which is best done by arthroscopy. 
so arthroscopy is uh, again uh, the best method uh, minimally invasive and uh, if you look into how we are going to fix this so screw is good and a best option for a single large fragment it is good to get compression so that there is early healing this disadvantage of screw is we cannot use it in multiple small fragments because uh, then there is no good hold on the all the fragments and uh, there are which screw there are chances of growth errors because we may cause a cross the proximal tibial physis in suture we use it in comminuted fractures and uh, the i'll show the examples of both so screw fixation is here i we try to avoid going through the physis so we just talk just short of physis in this case and uh, it was fixed nicely went on to heal uh, in suture we loop around the acl pull the all the comminuted fragments onto the tibial plateau and fix it with a high strength suture onto the uh, uh, metaphysis anteriorly so this is how uh, suture fixation was done for multiple for small fragments so if you very closely look at the ap x ray one of the fragment is still off there is a little uh, elevated so that is the problem with screw uh, suture fixation you may not always get hold of all the fragments onto the meta onto the bone and there may be a little bit of uh, irregularity so and and again it takes long time to heal because uh, there's no good compression how it is with the screw so screw will heal very fast so the build so take home message from from this table span fractures is it is a unique fracture in children there are a lot of associated injuries which have to be looked into there is always and always a obstacle to reduction which needs to be moved away to fix the fragment whether to use a screw or a suture is again a single large fragment a screw will be a better option multiple small fragments a, a suture will be a, a amenable to fixation so thank you so very molin, much molin yes i had spoken to my arthroscopist you know uh, uh, he mm -hmm. he had told me he always uses screw fixation and he always advises screw removal right so that's so, right yes. now we screw? we have a few questions yeah chintan you can go ahead on discussion on that part so yes sir, screw fixation is uh, always better than suture as i said suture will take longer time to heal but if you have multiple small small fragments you may not get hold of everything in yeah, the yeah. screw and then it is always so we may have to shift from screw to suture if at all on table we see that you know or sometimes while putting the screw the fragment is so thin it may uh, shatter so it is very important to do it very nicely and yes uh, like tibial tuberosity uh, tibial spine fractures also 4 to 5 months also you can remove the screw if you see you want a longer time in a years time you should remove it the head is still just under the acl the head of the screw for compression so we want that to come out the metal to come out from the joint so it is always better so, to remove uh, so the message doesn't cause was any to get, message was to get more aggressive operatively in these fractures basically yes, the, both. the trend was to conserve not to conserve them yes. both hmm. of them hmm. and how how easy or difficult it is to put a screw across if you do open see most of us do not have like we have arthroscopist help with us but those who do not have arthroscopist colleague or who are not trained how difficult it is to put a screw across if you do an open thing you know so so in arthroscopy also if uh, you have done it with your arthroscopy friends uh, we cannot put the screw from the portal that we use for arthroscopy so the portal is for visualization or for the meniscus repair but the screw will always and always require a uh, parapatellar different portal because the trajectory of the screw has to go in that way so even if you do arthroscopically we always do a parapatellar mini open so as to get the screw uh, guide wire the screw driver and the screw position in the direction of the fracture geometry So, so to to some extent does it become a blind procedure or we can visualize the fragment completely if you are doing a complete open then you can do like a you know how you open the knee in septic arthritis you can do a parapatellar open the knee look at the fragment again meniscal interposition may be there so again when you are, you, you want to do remove, a, yeah? yes you which may we can to, correct by open procedure also okay but then open will have more stiffness will have delayed healing all those issues will be there with open arthroscopy is always the best so you can mobilize early there will be less stiffness again because this is a intra articular fracture stiffness like how there it was prominent hardware here it is stiffness is the most common enemy the complication 
Yeah, um, Goda and me, uh, there were some questions. You can uh, you can moderate those questions. Yes, sir. we have a question by Goda, sir. Uh, so, uh, can we use headless screws like AccuTrack? So, headless screws have been tried, but again, uh, the amount of compression we want. See, we are not exiting from the opposite cortex. So we don't have that hold from the opposite side. So a headless screw may not help us to get the good compression uh, at the fracture side, uh, at the fracture fragment. It, it has been tried, but then again, uh, gold standard is to use a CC screw. Okay. And uh, a question by Molin, sir. Uh, what is the incidence of associated knee ligamentous injuries in uh, tuberosity fractures? So you, you, you talked about that, that... Uh... Mm -hmm. In spine fractures, about 54%. In tibial tuberosity, how, how frequent? Uh, so, uh, our fracture line in the tibial So, yes, because of the sports or because of the uh, injury per se, there can be a meniscus. They have reported meniscus injury ACL, but it's not so common. One in a while case will have it. Most of these cases didn't have it. And uh, once they go on to heal. So, again, uh, it is not, as you asked me, whether MRI is always needed. Tibial tuberosity is not always needed because once you have fixed a fracture and there is ongoing medial joint line pain, you can do MRI later on because meniscus can be fixed later as well. It okay. is not so common. Right. Um, so let's uh, take uh, other questions. Spine, it is almost 50% of meniscal injury. So let's take other questions later, Meet, and uh, let Dr. Tushar start his presentation. Chintan, that was an excellent presentation. And the, all the points were taken well. Let's start with Tushar. The all questions we'll post you separately and then we'll post answers on in the fellows module. So, uh, is this theme? Yes. And am I hurt? Yeah. So, okay. So, this is definitely less glamorous, but probably more contextual fracture and a more contextual condition. Okay, so we are talking about uh, the proximal tibial metaphysial fracture and specifically we will talk about the Cosens phenomenon. So, uh, Chintan did speak about the classification of the tibial tuberosity and the tibial spine fractures, but I feel that it's so tough to remember because they, you hardly encounter them. So, this Scott Mubarak's classification of the entire gamut of proximal tibial fracture is one of the best to remember. So, you can have four types of injuries, valgus, varus, extension, and flexion avulsion. And as you can see by the illustrations, what each one of them is going to give. And what we are specifically addressing in my talk will be this proximal tibial fracture, which extra-articular metaphysial fracture, which is almost always a valgus injury. And hence, there is the onset of Cousin's phenomenon. Right? And also, we will see that the injuries which Chintan spoke about occur in the age group about 10 and the specifically these metaphysial fractures occur in the far younger age group. Hence, again, this uh, talk about Cousin's phenomenon because there is a problem of developing deformity and the scope of coming out of the deformity. However, I did find some textbook references which insist on uh, much more aggressive maneuvers to get your initial valgus reduced to as much as neutral, maybe a little bit of varus, slight overcorrection at the time of primary fracture itself. Uh, this was countered by Dr. Sheetal Parikh after my talk. He says that there is no need to get so aggressive. We may not use any hardware, but for definitely there is a scope for using cast wedging, which is shown in the middle image. Uh, to get a proper virus angulation. So, these are few examples from uh, textbook images and you can see this side is a fibula. So, this fracture has gone into valgus and they put a last, large cast wedge here and thereby trying to bring it to the near normal levels and therefore preventing Cousin's phenomenon. And you will notice that the cast is to be done in full extension of the knee okay, with virus molding and further cast uh, just a second, and further cast wedging in order to prevent what is called as cosins. Now, let us further go ahead and understand whether this 
posens is a real time phenomenon or actually it's a myth so now first i'll discuss two small cases uh, of my own which did not actually go into posens so uh, i had this patient come at the peak of the pandemic uh, okay so he was a four year old boy he was extremely anxious with anxious parents i didn't even could not even do an ap x ray so i immediately put put him into a slab and you know those times the trend was to call patients at a very long follow up so i called him like after 3 to 4 weeks and i was aghast when i saw this he immediately after removing the slab he had a large medial gap he also had associated fibular fracture which was apparent before and the patient was going into primary valves on top of this i found for, thought that if he gets a cousin's phenomenon it would become like a disaster and be very much more difficult to manage so at this point of time only i did an intrafocal osteoclesis fixed it with wires put him in a cast and we managed to get a very very good outcome in this patient and on still on a follow up till date he is not got a cousin's phenomenon so we'll see whether i did the right strategy or i didn't do the right strategy towards the end of my talk at that time i was not aware of the correct strategy i must tell you now i got another patient of a 2 year old girl with an upper tibial metaphyseal fracture note that the fracture is complete here this is not a green stick fracture again we presume it to be valgus but because there was a posterior angulation this didn't seem to so we gave the cast in slight flexion instead of being in extension but we managed to try to keep giving the varus mold as you can see and we got a good varus reduction and alignment and this patient you know came on a longer follow up for some other purpose and you can see she did very well with no valgus intent here so now is it really is a reality or is it a myth so what are the questions which we ask so what is cousins when was it first recognized why if at all does it occur how early or late can you call it cousins you know when you get the valgus when do you actually call it cousins in what percentage of patient population does it occur so if you have let's say 100 patients of proximal tibial metaphyseal fracture in what percentage will it occur which age group is it more common so if you have 3 year old versus 8 year old when is it more common is there a way to prevent it uh, and can we cast differently in order to get less of this cousins phenomenon <clears throat> uh, do we ever have to operate a patient who gets cousins if we are operating how do we operate and when do we operate for how long do we retain the device and is such surgery also full proof or there are some fallacies of the surgery itself and if we do not operate what happens at skeletal maturity so let's see via the review of literature how we can answer so another feature that i'll tell you is that you will get roughly about 54 articles when you search for cousins but along with that you have to put the terminology post traumatic tibia valga so everybody does not use the term cousins right so it's an interesting phenomenon you can use the term post traumatic tibia valga whenever you want to search and if you want to specifically search for surgery for cousins you will find two to three articles repeatedly coming back which have been incorporated in this current literature review so the first article is a original article by cousin himself and in this he found that all the fractures which were initially displaced in the first year itself presented with valgus and they were he gave 15 degrees as the significant value so if you have a femorotibial angle of more than 15 degrees then you find that parents get concerned so 15 degrees was the specific value which he said and he actually managed to he actually at that point of time felt that a long brace with a proper molding would actually help correct the tibia valga but this is older article so they spoke about long brace shoe correction also which probably the brace which we may have done away with now this is another article by skack which is also very prominent in all the uh, it's very well cited so he describe the upper tibial fractures into four types fisher buckle green stick and complete and he says that only green stick and some complete fractures will undergo a uh, tibia valga the, the fisher and buckle fractures never undergo tibia valga so this is a very important point so if you ever have just a torus or a small fisher fracture of the upper tibia they are not going to go into uh, a cousin's phenomenon 
and after his table he says that only 15% of his green stick and complete fracture had cousins so if you have like 100 green stick fractures only 15 of them will have tibia valga but he had two interesting phenomena he said that even when you leave them for natural remodeling they move, they remodel in an s shape manner as you can see so the tibia becomes s shape and almost all of them have a certain tibia lengthening associated with eventual healing which has been corroborated by all our other papers so if you ever get a patient of proximal tibial metaphyseal fracture you may find that there is a certain subtle lengthening of that leg which can persist till skeletal maturity as well which is shown in one of his textbook images he gave very interesting take on the theories of why does it occur so there is lateral growth retardation there is expansion of soft tissue trapped in the fracture and this is a very important point which was not mentioned anywhere else that he feels that there is an inherent valgus in the entire diaphysis of the tibia and he says that there is a medial periosteal rupture which gives away the medial tether okay and therefore patient goes into a valgus as they grow ahead and also any patient who has more than 6 to 8 degrees valgus primarily at the time of healing is also very likely to go into cousins phenomenon remember this so you should try to bring the initial valgus to less than 6 degrees if you want to prevent a cousins phenomenon this article is also very regularly cited though they have dealt with only a single case but this is one of the well illustrated case of using a eight plate so two years after the trauma and the valgus diagnosis they used eight plate and roughly after 18 months they got complete correction okay so only the late onset valgus is called as a cousins phenomenon not the primary valgus they also have given lot of theories for presence of cousins phenomenon and they say that even in absence of initial valgus angulation you may have patient progressing to valgus the main purpose of their article is to say that you should ideally follow all tibial metaphyseal fractures to skeletal maturity to actually comment what is going to happen to them in terms of tibia valga okay and they find that the increase of valgus happens in the first 6 to 17 months so this answers another one of our question up to when can you get tibia valgus you can get it up to as late as 17 months and once you establish that this is cousins then it can improve in the next 2 years so you have 2 years to wait before you contemplate putting in a eight plate also they mention the fact that if the patient is coming to you at 8 9 or 10 which is do rare they may not remodel and therefore use of growth modulation in later presenters is more important so now this is a trick uh, article which they talk about surgical intervention in cousins but actually they say that none required so they say half of their patients got cousins and all resolved and they also cor corroborate the findings that it happens between 8 to 19 months they have given an additional theory which says that there is a tethering of the iliotibial band which can cause this cousins phenomenon and you see very few patients actually go beyond this 20 degrees mark which is actually the sort of significant mark of tibia valga where you may have to intervene so they feel that if you follow for as long as 8 years which they have done all of them will resolve the residual valgus at skeletal maturity is 1.5 degrees which may not be significant and the residual lengthening is about 0.6 cm okay but they in this article they say that there lot of emphasis on initial reduction and if necessary even a mini open reduction or use of hardware to prevent primary tibial valgus now the P peter stevens articles naturally will talk about eight plates so they go in very early as early as 6 to 8 months following the diagnosis of cousins phenomenon and they talk about over correction so they take about 3 5 6 degrees of over correction and they that prevents the recurrence of tibia valga according to their paper and now they have this trend of removing only the metaphyseal screw in order to reapply it if there is a recurrent tibia valga 
and their average hardware retention time was 60 months. So that answers our other question. If we use eight plate, there is bound to be some recurrent tibia valga and hardware retention is for 16 months. And they talk about regional acceleratory growth phenomenon, which is the theory for the Posen's phenomenon. They have also published at the time of Staples in 2006. Okay. So Peter Stevens has two articles on growth modulation for tibia valga. Now there is this article, which is for the first time mentioning that you cast only in extension with var varus mold. Some of us tend to cast in about 10, 15 degrees of flexion, which should not be done in these primary tibial metaphysial fractures. So now this paper talks about the tibia valga theories. So when we talk about vascular response and growth stimulation, eight papers supported this. Soft tissue interposition at fracture site, five papers support this. Loss of fracture reduction or initial mal reduction of fractures, four papers support this. Tethering by fibula or iliotibial band, four papers are supporting. And early weight bearing and cast and callus problems, only two papers were supporting this theory. And there is now this current 181 patient uh, paper from Howard, which says that all that is trash. You don't want to follow up all the patients, only those with coexistent fibular fractures or a large metaphysial gap. These are the only two criteria which you should follow. And only these two patients will have significant tibia valga and almost all of them will also not require any operative intervention. So, let us see whether I, we could answer. <clears throat> so we need to make every attempt to minimize the valgus at the time of primary treatment. Regional hypervascularity theory and medial overgrowth is the most favored theory. Cast in extension with the varus mold is the best way to treat them. When you have a green stick fracture of the upper tibia along with a proximal fibular fracture and a large medial gap, they are the ones to go into tibia valga. Follow up for the first 18 months of no matter what in order to rule out cousins. If patient is symptomatic and parents are very concerned, then only you offer guided growth modulation. That also after they go into more than 15 to 20 degrees of tibia valga, you can delay your uh, offering of growth modulation to up to two to three years from the time of in index trauma, two to three years. Hardware retention will be for another one year to one and a half years. And you should err on the side of slight overcorrection. You may remove only the metaphysial screw and never, never do an ostotomy to correct the posings. Thanks a lot. That, that was a fantastic talk uh, and the great uh, dive into the literature about Kozen, Tushar. And I, I feel that uh, all the questions were answered. Uh, just a thing about just removing the metaphysial screw and if needed, I mean, it, it takes only five minutes to put an eight plate back. So in, in our scenario, the at most of the times parents are not uh, kind of, because this means that you are going back to theater, if not putting screw in, uh, removing the plate. So we can explain and, and, the, and the best side would be to overcorrect a bit. Uh, so that if it if at all it gets uh, rebound, there will be neutrally corrected. So that I think uh, let's move on to the next uh, presentation. And uh, if any question, we can ask you personally. But this was a wonderful talk, and all the fellows should go through it again, and so they would uh, uh, learn all the points about Kozen. Thanks, Tushar. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay. And so, I'm going to talk uh, something uh, different than what Tushar talked. We are going to talk about tibia vara, and these are unilateral tibia vara cases. So, this one and a half years old boy presented with unilateral tibia vara. Parents were concerned that child started walking at the age of one year. And since then, they have observed that this uh, right leg is going in more and more. Now, this patient was from a very remote place. 
in year 2007 i saw this child and i got an x ray and uh, this was the x ray so i repeatedly inquired with that uh, village family uh, that whether your child sustained a fracture or uh, did he have any trauma infection but there was no history of trauma there was no infection there was no similar deformity in family and for me it was uh, uh, you know it was like we i had seen a blount's case but there the pathology would be more proximal than distal now when we took the lateral x ray there was like a punched out lesion in the proximal medial tibia and as if there was an osteoblastoma uh, on the lateral film there is sclerosis which is surrounding this lytic area but this child was pain free there was no pain so there was no question of any bony uh, lesion malignancy and you will see the scanogram or standing film of this child you can see there is tibia vara and there is punched out lesion of the tibia and then uh, i did not know what to do the child was very young so out of my uh, uh, lake of knowledge i say that I'll do something once I come back from my fellowship program. And then I got to meet Dr. William Cole, who was one, one of my mentors there and at Sikkis, who was originally from Melbourne. And they have described this pathology as focal fibrocartilaginous dysplasia. And that, that is causing tibia vara. So they found such three cases in Melbourne and they reported it. What they found that uh, they have a typical x-ray picture of punched out lesion in the proximal tibia, as you can see here. Usually the passenseriness inserts on the proximal medial tibia with a small fibrocartilage uh, uh, present there. They opened these lesions and they found that the fibrocartilage analog was very robust and it is going all the, all the way through the cortex up to the metaphysis. And that was producing probably a tethering effect. And so there was tibia vara with apex at the site of tether. And out of three patients, they, they surgically removed that tethered in two and they did the osteotomy. But the third girl who was about two years of age was, uh, so these are the MRI pictures. Uh, this where they, they have shown this, uh, the passenseriness is included uh, inside the cortex. So, so the other name of this pathology is fibrous inclusion, or they typically told them based on the histopathology, that is focal fibrocartilaginous dysplasia. So then the third patient of their series, uh, she improved by herself. So two patients, they operated for removal of fibrous inclusion. And, and they did osteotomy. So earlier recommendation was for with this was to operate, remove the inclusion. But the third child improved spontaneously. And then more and more papers came and discussing about what is the natural history of this focal fibrocartilaginous dysplasia in the young child. Now this series from Europe had 11 patients and they found spontaneous resolution in most of their patients. The patients in which it did not improve was where the tibiofemoral uh, tibio angle of more than 30 degrees and they suggested that those patients need intervention or the patients who shows progress, uh, progressive deformity, they would need intervention. But uh, early the uh, period of waiting for about a year is really important to demarcate that whether it is progressing or regressing. So. As I was not aware to what to do for this child, when I came back from my fellowship program, I called the patient back and the, and the father sent me these pictures and said, my child is all right. And his leg got corrected. So, and I also saw on clinical pictures that uh, his uh, virus on right side, if not, it is partially corrected. And they sent me an X-ray from their place and which shows that there is gradual remodeling from what where we started as the child is growing up. So, and then they never came back to me uh, even after I called them many times, but I presume that the child got corrected by itself. Now, 
very recently, one of our orthopedic colleagues, niece, uh, presented to us with this uh, uh, clinical and radiologic picture. And again, if you look at this tibia very closely, there is a punched out lesion with surrounding sclerosis. And you fear like uh, there is a growth arrest line on the medial side. Uh, uh, and the proximal tibial metaphysis is leaking like we see in the Blount's disease. But now we know that this is a, a, a FFCD. And I, to I talked to them about uh, potential of this to gra uh, gradually correct it with time, although this tibiofemoral angle was more than 20, 25 degrees. So this was uh, the X-ray at one and a half years. And you can see the mechanical axis is passing medial to the joint line. On further follow-up of four months, the deformity actually was found to be more progressive. Family was concerned, but I was still um, uh, with the literature and said, Let, let's wait further. And this is about uh, eight, nine months further. Uh, I cannot see how much. Yeah, so this was in September 21. And uh, this, as you can see, there was further the mechanical axis is on the medial side and family is now reluctant to wait and they uh, the deformity was um, was progressing so they were concerned now that we don't want to wait you do something because they have been waiting for almost a year now uh, since we have seen this and then we we went on doing the growth modulation so that was at the age of 2.1 years and uh, uh, four or five months follow-up you can see that this has started correcting gradually now at 13 months follow-up after index procedure it has started correcting but as you can see the eight plate has probably exhausted and the plate is kind of backing off to give more and more correction. So, uh, so this is how it looked at uh, that time. And still the deformity is not corrected. So I convinced them that we have to readjust the plate uh, and the screw. So this was uh, December 22. And uh, further, you can see the, we have replaced the plate and it started correcting. And this is uh, just we meet called this patient yesterday as we had to present today but you can see this deformity is almost uh, well corrected and after some time we will remove it once we achieve some valgus correction so um, yeah so from here we could reach here and in this case family uh, did not want to wait more because it makes that affected extremity apparently shorter and truly shortened as well. In some patients, we, we see that they're, they're limb, there is limb length discrepancy. The affected side is short. And so even though we say we can wait till 30 degrees, even 20 degrees of virus malalignment, child walks with a significant limb, which is uh, very worrisome for the family. Now, this is Tarl's case. Again, two and a half year old girl, uh, and he kept they kept on waiting. Uh, but it didn't correct and uh, a growth modulation was done. This was at three months follow-up. Now this patient came to me uh, after this surgery done by Tharal about a year later, the deformity has, has not been improving. So this is what um, I have seen in few of my cases and as, as well in Tharal's case that it takes a little longer time to correct compared to those metabolic deformities because when we put an eight plate, it needs some time for detethering of that fibrous inclusion and restoration of growth from the medial uh, physis. So parent might complain that even after doing surgery, why this is taking long time, but you have to tell them that it might take a little long time, but it gradually gets corrected. So this is a two and a half years follow-up and this is three years follow-up. Now, there is uh, you can see there is limb length discrepancy in the tibia. Uh, but there are papers which shows that this limb length discrepancy resolves as the child grows. But in two of these cases with the Tharal and mine, we have seen discrepancy. But families are not coming back. And I hope that this um, deformity, uh, this discrepancy uh, would resolve. Uh, they are still in our follow-up. So if I conclude, 
about focal proximal fem, uh, focal fibrocartilaginous defect in tibia the natural history shows a spontaneous resolution in most of the cases if there is progressive deformity and tibio femoral angle is more than 30 degree one might need intervention the earlier recommendation uh, where it was suggested to remove the fibrous inclusion and do osteotomy is no longer existing now the recent report suggests that growth modulation can correct the deformities and you keep the implants until it is bit overcorrected and then you then you uh, remove it the focal fibrocartilaginous dysplasia has been reported in other bones like femur ulna dr johari sir has published a recent paper in distal femur but the uh, the treatment principle has been the same you observe for some time if it doesn't resolve then you intervene so thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, it's 2 minutes past 9 and uh, yes uh, sujeet this was focal fibrocartilaginous dysplasia so any question one or two question i can take or else we will discuss it on fellows group do we have any question goda or me no sir we have no question perfect so let me stop sharing so i hope uh, this session uh, would help in your practice uh, you need to see only one case and then you will remember for lifetime i saw uh, a focal fibrocartilaginous dysplasia in dr bill cole's talk in sick kids and i i would never forget in my life and i hope those who are uh, attending this session you will also not forget this uh, so all the talks were great chintan that was a great talk uh, tushar that was fantastic coverage of review of literature and and uh, uh, mine was very simpler talk but i i hope uh, you all will enjoy thank you very much have a good day and uh,